Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up for the past 24 or so hours. And what a 24 hours it's been, with of course the official reviews of the third generation Threadripper processors going live, plus of course Cascade Lake X reviews going live, several major announcements in technology, plus some stuff for the next generation consoles. I've been pretty much absent the last couple of days because I've been recovering from the plague, so recording duties have been left to Amy, but the good news is I seem to be on the road for recovery, which is good given the crazy week in technology that is lying ahead of us. But with that said, I want to start things out with Zen Free rumours, the first of which concerns the level 1 cache of the processors. Credit to Bits and Chips on his English Twitter account for this, by the way. I'll, of course, link him in the description of this video. I'm going to read his tweet verbatim. According to the latest rumour, Zen 3 Level 1 Cash will be about 40% faster than Zen 2 Level 1 Cash, over 2,000 gigabytes per second. No data about Level 2 or Level 3. He also went on to say that he's not actually sure what's exactly going on with the cache in terms of, let's say, whether it's being increased in size. The rumour has it that the Level 3 cache will be increased in size of the processor. After all, AMD did that release that official slide. Plus, I've also heard a few things whispered to me as well. But what's going on with the level 2 cache in terms of its size or uh, bandwidth, we don't know. And obviously we don't know what uh, changes are being implemented to level 3 other than potentially an increase in the size of the cache. If this information is accurate, and at the end of the day we don't know whether it is a, or not, although his sources have been pretty good in the past, it's a very interesting change. It would seem to indicate that AMD are trying their darndest to, to reduce latency across the CPU cores. Basically, they are increasing the level 3 cache by a considerable amount. It looks like it's at least 50% from what the rumours are and increasing the speed and bandwidth of the caches as well, at least the smallest cache, the vastest cache. So it would look like that their goal is to basically reduce the latency associated with getting data from the main system memory. And while we're on the subject of Zen 3, I'd like to take you back a couple of days uh, when, of course, the Street.com were interviewing Forrest Norod. Now, he did make some rather interesting claims regarding the performance gains of Milan slash Zen 3, and we did cover these extensively a few days ago, but I do want to refresh your memory. He stated that, that Zen 2 delivered a bigger IPC gain than what's normal, what's typical for a, quote, evolutionary upgrade. AMD themselves said it's around 15%, which, from our testing, seems quite accurate. And the reason behind this is, well, several reasons, but one of the big ones is that Zen, the original architecture that debuted in 2017, had some features which basically got left out. They just did not have time to implement them. Therefore, AMD then uh, implemented those into the Zen 2 architecture. However, he then went on to emphasize that Zen 3 is not going to be a marginal upgrade. Instead, it's going to be a completely new architecture, and I'm going to read this out verbatim, AMD is confident in being able to drive significant IPC gains each generation, and this was in response to when being questioned what uh, uh, AMD would be doing since Intel are promising double-digit IPC gains for their own future microarchitectures. So in mid-October of this year, one of my sources told me that Zen 3's IPC gains are, quote, greater than 8%, end quote, but AMD were still doing internal testing to ascertain exactly what the performance gains are, and of course different workloads will stress the chip in different ways. Since then, though, I've had another source which has told me that we could see up to 17% IPC gains, which would be ridiculously impressive, as I'm sure you'll agree. And someone else has told me that it's around the middle ground, around 11 to 12%, once again, depending upon the application. So if it's something like Cinebench, it's going to be on the lower end, but on the other hand, if it's something that's going to be more favourable to the Zen 3 architecture, it could be faster. 
This means that AMD are going to continue to put a ridiculous amount of pressure on their competition over the next 12 months. And this also means that for consumers, it's going to be a very interesting question of what do they do in terms of their upgrade path. A couple of friends of mine are thinking of buying uh, hardware over Christmas, and they're kind of deciding, do I buy a 3600 now, and then upgrade to the Ryzen 4000 series next year, maybe buy additional processor cores then, or, you know, what do I do? It's, it's, it's quite interesting in terms of the just speed that uh, the processor market has been moving over the past couple of days. And, it, oh, sorry, over the last couple of years. And now let's discuss the 3990X. That's right, AMD have officially confirmed that a 64-core, 128-thread processor is going to launch, although we don't have pricing information or all of the specifications yet. And by all of the specifications, I mean anything other than the core count, which once again is, 100, is 128 threads, 64 cores, and the total cache, which is 288 megabytes. Although, can we just, just for one second, appreciate 288 megabytes of total cache? Oh, my system in the 90s and early 2000s didn't even have that for the total memory in the system. And yes, I'm including the video memory and main system RAM. Just crazy. Anyway, uh, the TDP is 280 watts, which is pretty darn good considering 64 cores are going to be running in this thing. But what is quite interesting is that the rumours are abound that we will still see an 8 memory channel workstation platform launch. And there are some questions then exactly how AMD are going to segment their lineup. One thing I've heard is that the same CPU will run in both platforms. But obviously if you have it in let's say the TRX40 platform you will only have access to four memory channels. Whereas if you're in the WRX40, uh, sorry, 80 platform, you will have access to eight memory channels. Although it's always potentially possible that this isn't the case and you will have to buy a processor that is respective to the platform that you are looking to use it on. There has been precious little solid information regarding the workstation side of the equation though. I've been told that it's definitely coming by a couple of pretty reliable sources, but they can't provide me specifics. Steve over at Gamers Nexus also has quite a lot of information as well that he's gone into and he's been told it's also coming. And so there's a good probability that AMD will do this. After all, they've been hiring quite the number of people on the workstation side of the company and it's also a i don't want to say weakness because to say amd have a product weakness is not very accurate at the moment uh, at least on the cpu side the the gpus of the company yes they definitely have some uh, weaknesses like a really high-end gpu for example they're missing at the moment but on the cpu side of things they're basically plugging every single hole that is in their product portfolio, they are basically going up and down the stack. So it's going to be really interesting what actually happens on the workstation side of the equation, as well as what prices AMD choose to charge for these CPUs. Uh, the 64 core 128 thread processor, they have no official price listed at the moment. Uh, we know that, of course, the 3960 and the 3970 aren't exactly cheap, they're charging like 2000 bucks for the 70X. So there's two ways you can look at this. The first is that they can just say, well, um, we just want to put as much pressure on Intel as possible. We just want to completely dominate the HEGT market and we're gonna charge a pretty low fee. And let's say $3,000. I'm throwing figures out there. This is not what I've been told. Um, but another potential possibility is like, well, you know what? Intel have nothing that is able to compete with a 64-core HEDT processor. So screw it. We're just going to charge as much money as possible. And this is going to be a Halo product with high margins. It's going to be interesting with the route they choose to go. And the final pieces of news that I'd like to cover today. Uh, the first of which is an update reg regarding Stadia. And, well, yeah. 
There's not much to say about Stadia that hasn't been said a lot. And now on to the final few news pieces for the day. I really want to discuss a statement from Google regarding Stadia. Stadia has been... Let's go with interesting with how people have been perceiving the product even prior to its launch, but also receiving it in terms of public opinion now that it has launched. Some people are pretty impressed with low latency. Other people claim that latency is awful. But one thing that has definitely got Google in trouble recently is the claims of 4K 60fps for all games. And that just isn't the case. Certain games are running at 1440p. A statement was issued to Eurogamer, and the statement claims that Stadia does stream at 4K 60fps, and that includes all aspects of our graphics pipeline. Game to the screen, GPU encoder, and Chromecast, all outputting at 4K to 4K TVs with the appropriate internet connection. But developers are making Stadia games work hard to deliver the streaming experiences for every game. Like you see in all platforms, this includes a variety of techniques to achieve the best overall quality. As a slight aside, I don't think I've ever seen an instance where lowering the resolution to 1440p from native 4K and also halving the frame rate is the best way to improve overall quality, but I'll let them continue. We give developers the freedom of how to best image quality and frame rate on Stadia, and we're impressed with what they've been able to achieve for day one. We expect that many developers can, in most cases, continue to improve their games on Stadia. And because Stadia lives in the data centers, our developers are able to innovate quickly while delivering better experiences directly to you without the need for patches or downloads, end quote. The problem is, of course, that at the end of the day, the virtual machines that are running in the cloud have finite resources. They are not going to allocate 500 GPUs to what a developer wants to achieve with their game. In other words, they are based on AMD Radeon hardware, you have 8 CPU cores, blah, 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 and... If you have a game like Red Dead Redemption 2, shockingly, it requires an awful lot of hardware grunt to run. It just is that simple. I don't have a problem, to be honest with you, with the games running at 1440p or 30fps. What I do have an issue with is the way that the statement originally was formed, and I kind of had a feeling that this would be the case. Obviously, if you've got a game like, let's say, Doom 2016, or the upcoming Doom Eternal... It's not as difficult to run, just the way that the game was created. It was intended to, with the engine to be able to just, well, run at pretty modest hardware at high resolution and at high frame rate. But a game like Red Dead Redemption, simply because it's a completely different beast entirely, it's extremely graphically intensive. It's going to be interesting to see what type of backtracking goes on with Google here. And if anyone actually ends up particularly caring about it. And finally, I want to discuss some PS5 slash Xbox Scarlet news, and this concerns the NVMe SSD, which will reside in both the next generation consoles. So, this was originally reported on PC Watch, and Han Jinman, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, from Samsung, provided a slide which seems to indicate that the company will be producing the SSDs for both next-generation consoles. Of course, this is not official confirmation, but he did say that the SSDs are being deployed on the gaming field in 2020, which, shockingly, will be the release date for both next-generation consoles. Of course, it's possible that this could be for the PC, but given we do know that SSDs are going to be incredibly important for the next generation consoles, it would make sense. Furthermore, we can see optimized NVMe, and Sony several times over now have stated that the SSDs inside the PlayStation 5 are indeed a custom design. Actually, one final, final thing that I want to bring to your attention, and this does concern the PS5 exclusively. You may recall the cartridge patent that has been floating around the internet for the past week or so. 
and the theory was that it contained the SSD for the PS5, so essentially you would be able to upgrade it through proprietary SSDs that you would simply slot into your system uh, because Sony would not want to risk you putting in a slower SSD which would negatively impact console performance. Well, that doesn't look to be the case at all because Sony have actually just published a new video and it is for a toy. I'm hopefully pronouncing this name correctly. It's a Toyo drive. And, well, yeah, you can see the, the cartridge right there. It looks almost identical to what we are seeing in the video. And, well, pretty much this is just a toy. Uh, this has got nothing at all to do with the PlayStation 5. It's an interactive game system designed specifically for young kids. Uh, this is why I've said many times over that a pattern is a pattern, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to either become a full product or that the patent could be something entirely different to what you expect it to be used for, because patents are deliberately written to be as generic as possible, not only for legal reasons, but of course they don't want people digging through them and then trying to get as much information as possible. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I apologise for any sudden kind of snips in the audio. Unfortunately, as I said, I'm getting over the plague at the moment, so the odd random cough here or there, so I need to cut that out. But with all of that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.